Hi, welcome. Thank you all for coming um, this, to the science stage. My name is Luis. I'll be your moderator today, and I'm really happy to present Inge Loy. She's a planetary scientist here at the University in Utrecht. Um, she studies how organic compounds work on Mars, and she'll be talking to us about habitability in other planets. So, with no further ado, I present to you Inge Loy. Thank you. I, I have this one. So, thank you all for showing up. Um, I, it see, I see it's a relatively quiet, and that's basically my own fault because I cancelled because I got sick, but now I'm not sick anymore. Um, so I actually wanted to start ask, asking you a question. Uh, I hear myself, which is highly annoying. Um, how, how many of you have ever explored the idea of um, living somewhere outside the Earth, for example? Okay, well, that's good. So what I'm actually going to talk to you about today is um, habitability. Uh, and what you're seeing here um, is um, sunset on uh, Earth uh, and on five different exoplanets who uh, circle uh, around a different sun. So what you see here is what it looked like if you would be on a Gliese uh, 581d, which is a, a, a terrestrial exoplanet that was detected a couple of years ago. Uh, and this is an example for, for different planets. So it just gives you an idea what it looks like if you would be on a terrestrial planet orbiting a different star than our own. Um, so actually what I'm going to do to you is explain to you a little bit what habitability is, um, where you can find habitable uh, planets, and um, yeah, how we define uh, habitable zones, uh, and how we define uh, habitability in itself. Uh, and just to give you an idea, if I don't know what kind of challenges you're working on, um, if, for example, human life, but also other life would be possible there. So if you would think about creating a mission or you think uh, about a, a project like the Martian, for example, um, what, you would, uh, what you would have to consider uh, in order to design a mission like that. Um, so first, of course, we have to start with a definition. Uh, and then uh, what I tend to do for these kind of things, uh, you read a uh, Exopedia. And what is the most useful encyclopedia? That's obviously Wikipedia. And Wikipedia defines habitability as a planet or a natural satellite. Because we're not only talking about planets, because if you look in our solar system, uh, we, for example, also study uh, the moons, uh, Europa, and Enceladus for habitability. So it's, it's both planets and satellites, uh, and their potential to develop and sustain life. So not only would it be possible to develop life there, but if life is there, would, it, would you be able to sustain it there? Um, but on the other hand, uh, of course, li Earth is the only system that we know uh, where life exists. So what you do is, uh, if you try to define something, you use what you know. Um, so we define habitability basically as an extrapolation of the conditions on the Earth. Uh, and the characteristics of the sun and of our solar system, uh, because they seem to be uh, uh, favorable to life, because uh, technically the Earth is the only planet where there is life. So this is our, our framework, and then we see how we can extrapolate that to other planets or other satellites. Uh, and then, uh, in particular, those factors that have sustained complex multicellular organisms and not just simple unicellular or, uh, creatures. Um, if, you, if you look, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this, but if you look at life and how life manifests itself on Earth, um, of course we see everything from, from unicellular life to everything as complex as we are. Um, and for both, you have a, a definition of habitability. And for unicellular life, it's much easier to create a niche than if you go to multicellular complex systems, because uh, they're, they're much more prone to be effective by, by different kind of conditions. Uh, so which environments do affect habitability? Well, first of all, this is an uh, artist's impression of a, uh, of a galaxy looking uh, like our own uh, Milky Way galaxy. Uh, and here you see the zone. Um, so the first thing that defines habitability is the galactic habitable zone. So I'm now going just to mention them, and I uh, talk you through this a little bit after this. So that's the first thing that affects your uh, habitability. The second thing that affects your habitability is a stellar habitable zone. Um, so here you see, uh, if this would be our Milky Way here, you see our sun and our solar system. Uh, and then if you look at our solar system, you see there's another zone around the star. 
called the habitable zone. Um, the host star and the composition of the host star affects the habitability. Uh, and of course the planet affects the habitability. Um, and then uh, there's actually a lot of people working on this. And they, uh, a few years ago, 12 years ago actually, they came up with four prerequisites for complex life. So uh, we're not talking about unicellular organisms now, we're talking about more complex life like us. So that's also something that you would have to take into account if you, for example, want to send a human mission somewhere else. So first of all, it seems that we need the presence of a host star because you need some energy source and a host star is generally providing that energy. Uh, you need enough heavy elements to form terrestrial planets. Uh, I talk about that in a little bit, but what we see, of course, here on Earth, we have a terrestrial planet, and it seems that a terrestrial planet is favorable for life. Uh, of course, there's all kinds of speculations. There are even people speculating about life possible on the clouds in the atmosphere of Saturn, but that's, uh, we call that speculation for now. Uh, it seems that you need sufficient time for biological uh, evolution. Uh, if you look here on Earth, uh, most likely unicellular life started pretty quickly after the Earth had formed, so probably within the first 500 million to 1 billion years. But then from there on, it took a really long time before that evolved into more complex life. There's another billion years before more conflict li complex life started to arise. So you actually do need quite some time for biology to evolve to more complex systems. Uh, and then, and this sounds a little specific, an environment free of supernovae. And I, I get back to that in a second as well. Um, so those are basically four prerequisites for complex life. Um, so first, I already mentioned a little bit this heavy element. So first I have to explain a little bit what I mean with heavy elements and also with metallicity. Um, and I'm sure you've seen a, a, a periodic system. Uh, what you see here is actually a plot that shows the abundance of the elements um, in, in space. Uh, so the majority of elements in space is, of course, hydrogen and helium. They make up the, uh, the majority of the, the uh, especially in, uh, now, uh, basically in the universe, the majority of the universe is made up of, of helium and hydrogen. And then you get the whole range of other elements. And actually, everything heavier than beryllium is within this context and within the context of astronomers called heavy. If you talk to chemists, they think of beryllium as extremely light and their heavy doesn't start before this and even higher. So it's really, you know, you have to know whom you're talking to uh, if you're, uh, for, for these kind of references. But in this case, a heavy element is everything heavier than beryllium. Um, and then another term that is used in this context is metallicity. Um, and that is again, depending on who you talk to, in this context, metallicity is actually the percentage of an object that is made, made out of elements that are heavier than hydrogen and helium. So that's even lighter than beryllium. So everything that, that includes anything other than hydrogen and helium is metallic, and then a percentage has, tells you something about metallicity. Okay, and these two are interesting and important because the heavy elements define the mass and the composition of a planet. And the mass and the composition define the interior heat loss, for example, the volatile content and the loss of an atmosphere. Uh, and the interior heat loss is something that keeps the planet dynamic. Uh, it, for example, it drives plate tectonics. We have a, what we see in the Earth, of course, we have a source of heat in the interior uh, that drives a, a convection that causes plate tectonics. Uh, plate tectonics uh, hel helps recycle atmosphere. Um, you need a volatile content as part of the planet because um, also by heating of the planet, by forming of the planet, you, you actually release part of those volatiles. They start forming an atmosphere around your planet. Um, and if you have no atmosphere, for what we know, it is very difficult to sustain life. So, and the mass and the composition of a planet define these three elements. So, Having, you, you need to have a planet of a certain mass and a certain composition, which is again then defined by the heavy elements. Um, for example, and I'm, I'm not going to go much in, into detail, but here uh, you see a few radioisotopes, uh, so 40 potassium, some uranium and some thorium isotopes, and these are the isotopes through radioactive decay generate the interior heat in the Earth. So they keep the Earth warm, they keep the convection going, they keep plate tectonics going, so that's how we keep our atmospheres. Um, 
And for example, uh, the abundances of silicon with respect to elements like magnesium and iron, uh, they affect the core mental mass ratio. And, and that's something again that you need to get a, uh, hey, you need that to get convection and to keep your planet warm and to keep your planet dynamic and active. So that's why those heavy elements are present, uh, are important. Uh, and what we also see is that, that if you look in the galaxy, those elements and those isotopes of those elements vary with time and location in the galaxy. So most of the heavy elements are in the inside in the galaxy and the outs outskirts of the galaxy are, are mainly depleted of heavy elements. So m m the most of the hydrogen and helium is in the outsides. Um, so if you now look what this means for a, uh, a habitable zone in a galaxy, you get this picture here. Uh, and here you see the, uh, the galactic habitable zone uh, with our sun here, if this would be our own galaxy. Um, and then you, have, you see that there's an outer edge and an inner edge. And the outer edge is defined by the minimum required metallicity to build Earth-like planets. So as I just said, uh, you see the metallicity, the, the most um, metallic and heavy elements are uh, close to the, the center. And the further out you go, the lower the metallicity gets. Um, so that's what the outer edge defines. And then we have the inner edge. Uh, and that is actually basically set um, both by metallicity, uh, but also by extinction causing factors such as high energy events, like the supernovae that I just talked about. Uh, because the uh, a galaxy is much more populated in its center, so you have much, much more events um, that can actually influence the stability of a solar system like ours. If we have a supernovae a few stars down, um, eventually that, that cloud of erupting uh, material will come our way and it will start interacting with our own solar system. And in our case, that means that we get, for example, more cometary impacts on the Earth, which is not very uh, good for the habitability of the Earth. Uh, it also affects the metallicity of the host star uh, because uh, the m there's more metallic material closer to the center, so you have also a larger chance of a higher metallic host star, uh, which also can lead to large planets close to the host star. So what you then get, for example, is a Jupiter or a large Jupiter close to the sun. Uh, and if you have a configuration like that, uh, a large Jupiter would prevent the formation of a terrestrial planet like the Earth. Um, so yeah, here again, what I just said, the high metallicity of a star likely leads to the formation of large planets close to the sun. So it prevents the formation of an, uh, a terrestrial planet like ours at a location where we are, or it disturbs that planet, so it, it's not quiet enough. Uh, and the gravitational perturbations, uh, so help express especially in our, uh, our galaxy, uh, our galaxy is centered around the black hole, so you can imagine that gives a lot of perturbations. Uh, from, from the pool from that black hole. Uh, and if you look at our solar system, we have our, our sun, planets nicely around that. Uh, on the outskirts, you have a Kuiper belt with all kinds of uh, debris that was left over and didn't form a planet. But if you go really far out, there's an enormous bubble of more of that material called the Oort cloud, which is uh, kind of surrounding our solar system. It's quite far out, so generally it doesn't do any harm. Every once in a while, we get a comet from the Oort cloud coming by. But of course, as soon as you get interactions from the outside, material in the Oort cloud can be perturbed and actually be uh, ejected towards the sun and then it can interact with planets that are, ha that are on its track, for example, the Earth. Um, so now we've seen why, where in a uh, galaxy you actually want to be uh, in order for your planet to be habitable. Uh, so the second thing that's important is the host star. Um, and I don't know if any of you are astronomers. A, this is a very uh, uh, a plot that astronomers work a, a very often with. Uh, it's called a hertzsprung russell diagram. Uh, and basically what it tells you, it tells you the spectral class of a star. Uh, and somehow uh, they put them in this completely random alphabetical order. Um, and um, the spectral class of a star tells you something about its temperature. Uh, and about its luminosity, so the amount of energy it puts out. And what you see here is O stars are the hottest at temperatures of 40,000 Kelvin, uh, M star are the coolest with temperatures around 2,500 Kelvin. Um, and may, the, the majority of the stars reside here on this main sequence, 
R star is a G star, so we are somewhere hiding here. Um, so as you see, there's actually a lot of stars in, in this region. Uh, and what we see here is, I already said that a little bit, what we see is we have the different classes of stars, and if you go up in class, your temperature goes up and your luminosity goes up. Um, and our sun, as I just said, is a G star. So we're somewhere around here. Um, and the host star seems to be uh, important for several reasons, at least, uh, again, if we related to life on Earth. Um, because what we want is we want to have a host star that le at least lives a few billion years, because you need enough time for life to evolve. You, I mean, unicellular life is interesting, but first of all, it's going to be a nightmare to detect it. Pro probably on Mars we would be able to find it, but as soon as you go further out, it's going to be extremely difficult. Um, of course, that's not a, not a reason to need, a, uh, to need unicellular life, but if you're interested in, in people who look for a SETI, work for SETI, for example, you look, look for extraterrestrial intelligent life, you need something that has more time to evolve. Um, so you need at least a, a few billion years of a solar lifetime uh, to potentially uh, get more complex life. So that immediately cancels out O, A, and B stars because they're too hot. And hot stars have a relatively long, a short lifetime. So they, they're, they're burned through their energy real quick and they tend to end up in a supernova. So even if they have planets, uh, the sun lives too short and then you're there uh, stuck on your planet getting all the debris uh, that's shed by the sun and the supernova. So that's not a very good uh, situation to be in. Uh, then also you don't want your planet, uh, your sun not to be too hot, but also not to be too cold. Um, so somewhere between four and 7,000 Kelvin seems to be a, a reasonable range. So that's early F to mid K uh, stars. Of course, we are without G star and ice in the middle. You want your star to emit just the right amount of UV radiation uh, because UV radiation is in a sort of one hand, of course, very uh, 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 toxic um, because it, it, it directs at us. It's, it's what causes our sunburns and skin cancer, for example. But the reason why you need UV radiation, it actually gives you some photochemistry. So it actually helps to create ozone uh, in our uh, uh, atmosphere and ozone is something that actually then protects you from UV. So you, you need some kind of photochemistry going on in your atmosphere to get protective layers, for example. So you want some UV radiation. Uh, but on the other hand, if you have too, UV, too much UV radiation, your UV starts reacting with your atmospheric species and reacts away your atmosphere. So then you're stuck with no atmosphere. So there's also this trade-off. And uh, you want low chances, changes in uh, luminosity. So you want a star that is relatively stable, uh, because you can imagine if your star is dim and then bright and then dim and then bright, it's very difficult for life to adapt to that. Because if you, hey, you need to be very quick in your evolution if you have to adapt to this kind of energy changes. Um, and then, very importantly, you need a star that permits liquid water on the planetary surface. Um, Again, that's of course based on what we know, but all life we know needs liquid water. Um, and this is called a circumstellar habitable zone. So we already saw a galactic habitable zone. Uh, and now you see the presence of a circumstellar habitable zone is also very important. So if we look at the circumstellar habitable zone, this is defined as a region around the star where liquid water can exist on the surface of a terrestrial planet. Uh, we already decided that terrestrial planets are uh, uh, seem to be uh, uh, something that life needs. Uh, and you'd like to have that for an extended period of time again, because you need your time for life to evolve uh, and you need some time for life to flourish. And then if you have water less extended periods of time, then hopefully life can eventually adapt to that. But that's, it, it, it doesn't seem that that's the, the, preferred, uh, the preferred situation. You want to st start with somewhat stable situation where you have liquid water for quite some time. Um, so that means that your, your, the range of your, uh, your circumstellar habitable zone should not vary too much over time. Uh, and that again has to do with your stellar luminosity. Uh, if you look at your star, even if you have a very stable star, eventually the luminosity of your star increases over time. So that means that your, your habitable zone also 
moves a bit further out. So that the same counts for our sun. I mean, we're now a hal a about halfway the lifetime of our sun, four and a half billion years. So in a few billion years from now, our sun will actually also become hotter. So that means that our habitable zone uh, also migrates further out. And I actually have a plot that um, makes that a bit easier. Um, and the second thing you don't want is a large Mars body like a Jupiter close to your habitable zone because a larger planet again interacts with your the stability of your planet or even the formation of your planet. So what you can see here, to come back to the story I was just telling, is here you see the different types that we just identified as potential uh, habitable uh, host stars, so to say. So between 3000 and 7000 Kelvin. And you see already that the, the colder the star, the smaller the habitable zone, and the closer to the planet your habitable zone. So this is where we are. We have our, our star is a little over 5000 Kelvin. This is an uh, average temperature, obviously, because the core of our star has a temperature of several million uh, degrees, uh, several billion degrees, sorry. So here you see the habitable zone of our star. If you go to a warmer star, you see that the habitable zone is wider, but also starts further. Um, but what we know of our sun is eventually, when our sun gets older, it gets warmer. So you can see that our habitable zone would actually um, extend further out, which means that eventually it will be too warm on the Earth uh, for habitable water to be present on the surface. Fortunately, this only happens uh, four billion years from now, so I don't think we personally have to be too worried about that. But that's something that you have to keep in mind. Um, and this is actually nice to see, because as you probably all know, it's, it's, uh, the, there's a search for exoplanets, and uh, they're really detected very frequently now. Uh, and on May 10th, NASA actually uh, presented a new uh, confirmation of nearly 1,300, I think 1,284 newly confirmed habitable planets. So that's not things that they detect that they think are planets, but they're really confirmed to be planets. Uh, and as you see in this uh, spot, some of them uh, are indeed in the habitable zone of their star. Um, and some of them are even terrestrial. So you see here a plot that of, of some of the uh, exoplanets that were found that were terrestrial and in the habitable zone of their host star. So that's very promising if you think about life outside our solar system. So if you have all these, these constraints now, and we're now only talked about the, the galactic habitable zone, the stellar habitable zone, and the uh, different conditions that your, your star has to, uh, different limitations that your star has to meet, then you can get an idea of planetary habitability and you can calculate its probability. And you can do that using this kind of uh, law. Uh, and of course, this is only a probability. And the chances, if you, if you uh, multiply this, you get to extremely low chance for now. Um, but what you do is, is basically the probability of some of the requirements that we just uh, talked about. So the probability that liquid water exists on the surface, uh, that you have a biological usable energy source. So I haven't really mentioned that yet, but if you have life, life requires energy, of course. So you either take your energy from the sun, you get your energy from food, you get your energy from heat. There's even life that gets energy from a, um, uh, a, a gradient, uh, oxidation gradient, for example, in, uh, in rocks, because uh, the oxidation gradient provides also uh, a current of electrons floating from the different oxidation states. Even that can be used as an energy source. Um, so, but you do need some energy source, otherwise your life cannot live, basically. Uh, again, you need a non-injurious environment, so you don't want uh, 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 supernovae close, you don't want uh, uh, any gravitational effects of, of your, uh, a black hole somewhere nearby. So you want something where it's, it's nice and quiet for a long time. Uh, and then, of course, the fourth thing, which is, is, is kind of necessary, is the building blocks of life. Uh, and that's a completely different story. Um, because the, then, of course, you get to the question, what are the building blocks of life? Do you, can you form them in situ? Do, you need, do they need to be formed in space and then delivered? Um, so that's, that's a whole different situation. But of course, if you want to build life, you do need a basic set of um, molecules that actually are the building blocks of life. And life uses 
uh, all life uses, uh, for example, amino acids, sugars, uh, fatty acids, uh, and those, those molecules need to be present, or at least the building blocks of those molecules need to be present in one way or the other, otherwise you can't build your, your life. So if you use that probability and this, this kind of uh, equation, you can get an, an idea of the probability of, for example, a planet or a moon. So then the next question is, what makes a planet habitable? Um, well, first of all, we think that terrestrials seems to be a, a good way, because what we also see is, for example, the minerals on the surface of the Earth uh, can uh, serve as catalysts for those uh, building blocks to actually catalyze themselves and react into bigger components uh, and actually start forming first cells, for example. Um, and something that I already mentioned uh, earlier, there are speculations that life, bacterial life, uh, could live in warmer parts of a uh, gas giant atmosphere. So these are speculations, and so far it's very difficult to, uh, to actually think of something that, that would work indeed. Uh, again, you want a planet which has sufficient mass. Uh, and the reason is that if you have too little mass, for example, Mars is, is a nice example for that. Mars is a much smaller planet than the Earth. Um, it has much less mass. So you have less gravity, so it's more difficult to retain your atmosphere, which is exactly the case uh, on Mars. Uh, the atmosphere on Mars is about one hundredth uh, of the atmosphere on the Earth. Um, but also, if your planet is smaller, has a smaller diameter, it loses energy more quickly, uh, and it's, you have less geological processing. Hey, you, so you, for example, you, you cannot start convection, uh, you cannot start plate tectonics, for, uh, and that seems to be a very important uh, uh, requirement for life. Uh, so y you want a relatively big planet uh, and su sufficiently uh, massive that you can actually retain your atmosphere and have some uh, geological processing going on. Uh, then another important point is a right uh, orbit ex orbital eccentricity. Uh, and that means uh, have we all orbit the sun in a somewhat circular uh, orbit. Um, but the thing is, of course, if you have a circular orbit, uh, your, your conditions are basically the same year round. But the more elliptical your orbit is, uh, the warmer it is one part of the year and the colder it gets uh, another part of the year. So then you get seasonality due to your orbit. But the more eccentric your orbit, you can imagine that at some point if you're too far out, that it's uh, in, the, in the winter part of your orbit, you get the temperatures continuously below, far below zero. And then that means that within a year, your life has to really adapt to warm temperatures and very cold temperatures. Uh, and that, that tends to be very difficult to, to uh, especially if you go to complex life, to actually uh, be able to cope with those kind of temperature fluctuations. Um, something else that's important, seems to be important, is some obliquity, they call it. It's actual tilt. So that's basically, uh, you have your rotation axis of your planet standing up like this. Uh, and what we see with Earth, uh, instead of rotating around the sun being straight up, the Earth is tilted about uh, 24 degrees or 23.7, uh, and what this obliquity does, it actually causes seasons on, on Earth. Um, and that's something that it, it seems that life we have on Earth seems to like seasons. Of course, ha this could also be a chicken and egg effect, because it, it does life seasons because we have seasons, or do we have life because we have seasons? That's, that's of course, you never really know that. Um, but if you don't have obliquity, the planet would actually be a lot colder, because due to this obliquity, we still get uh, circulation from the warmer and the colder points. But if you have your, uh, your, your, your planet is standing straight up, basically, you always have the same illumination on the poles and on the equator, and that makes it much more difficult, especially for hot air, to travel to the colder poles. So eventually, your temperature will equilibrate at the polar temperatures, which is much colder. Uh, so it keeps your planet much colder, and it looks from what we know from life on Earth, that life seems to like relatively mild temperatures. And if it's too bleak, you have two extreme seasons. Uh, something else that seems to be important is the actual rotation, so how fast do you spin around your own axis? Um, if you, you want to be relatively quick, uh, so that you don't get a very long day and night cycle, uh, that, again, has to do, for example, with, uh, with temperature and also the energy input. Uh, if you live on, a, uh, on the side of the planet that's, that has a, 
a half year a long night, it's, it's very difficult to get some energy source. So you need to get your energy from somewhere else. Uh, and also you want it to be uh, quickly enough for a dynamo uh, because what the dynamo of the earth does, it creates a protective magnetic field. So by the magnetic field, we're shielded from all kinds of uh, high energy solar radiation. Um, and something else, uh, just as a side note, what's interesting to see is we, of course, our rotation is uh, 24 hours. But if you, for example, look at Venus, the rotation of Venus is 243 days. So it takes Venus forever to actually rotate around its own axis once. Um, so something else that may make a planet habitable is the moon. Uh, what our moon does, for example, is keep uh, the obliquity stable. Uh, and again, the presence of the right elements. Um, as I said before, you need building blocks of life in order to build, build life. Uh, and what we mean with the presence of the right elements uh, are those six, so that's carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, uh, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Those are the really uh, the, elemental uh, the elements that are uh, used by every form of life, uh, and all the basic building blocks are composed of these elements. Um, so this seems to be the starting set of elements that you need in order to have to make a planet habitable. So that's when you end up with the Earth. So what we do is we use the Earth as a reference, and this is because it's the only example we have. Um, and if we look at the comparative planetology in the solar system, this indicates that the Earth's habitability may actually be near optimal for complex life. Again, of course, this is chicken and egg and kind of um, petting our own bags because have, we are complex life and for us the conditions are optimal. And, and uh, of course, you can hypothesis as much as you want how other complex life under other conditions would look like. Um, but that's not what I'm going to do here. So I'm just sticking to what we know. Uh, and then we use Earth as a reference. But then if we look at terrestrial life, terrestrial life actually also has kind of its limits. Um, and here we can look at humans, which is extremely complex life, versus bacteria, which, of course, they're still complex if they're multicellular. And if we look at single cellular, they're, they're really much simpler than, than humans. Um, and actually, this kind of d division between humans and bacteria really uh, ch changes quite a bit our definition of habitability. Uh, and here you can look at limits of life and growth on one side and limits of survival on the other side. Um, and then you have physical factors such as temperature, pressure, uh, radiation, uh, aridity, so that's the amount of humidity that there is, eh, or how dry the, the environment is. And on the other hand, you have chemical factors such as salinity, so the amount of salt, uh, pH, uh, and solvents. Um, and of course, on Earth, uh, water is the main solvent, and water is driving most of the chemistry. Uh, but you can think of other uh, solvents as well. Um, so if we look at those factors, a bit more in depth, so we, for example, look at temperature, pressure, salinity, and pH, and we compare humans versus bacteria, then you can get an idea of how habitable the Earth is. And then if you start looking at other systems, uh, for example, other exoplanetary systems or other moons in our own solar system, uh, you can get an idea of would it be habitable for complex life or are we talking about habitable for only very simple life? Of course, what we do is we use human conditions and then call something conventional. So for, so for us, if you look at temperature, the temperature ranges for us, it's, it's optimal between 20 and 37 degrees. So this is the human body. Under 20 degrees, uh, you're basically too cold to keep living. Uh, and above 37 degrees, you have fever. And above 40 degrees, your body doesn't really maintain itself either. Um, so if you look at pH, uh, human life uh, prefers to be between 6 and 8, or actually even closer to neutral pH of 7. Uh, and if we look at salinity, this is basically the, the range of salinity in which humans live. But this is not, I mean, this is the salinity of uh, uh, human blood, for example. We can't drink 3% salinity. That seawater, if you drink seawater, you actually die. So you see, this is what we call normal. But the question is, are those conditions actually that normal? Uh, because everything that's outside these parameters we call extreme eh, and toxic. So here you see a, a lake in Yellowstone, a very acidic high temperature lake. Uh, here you see uh, the Dead Sea, which has a very high salinity. 
Uh, here you see black smokers uh, on the surface of the ocean, the bottom of the ocean. Uh, here you have temperatures of 400 uh, Celsius, for example. Uh, here you see sulfur, uh, sulfur volcano. Um, and these are, of course, conditions that human life would not, uh, not survive. But the question is, are we actually that normal? And uh, if you look at actually already in 1940, uh, microorganisms were detected in the Dead Sea. And seawater has an aridity or a, uh, a salinity of three and a half percent. If we drink that, we actually uh, poison ourselves. Our drinking water has a salinity of 0.9%. Uh, in 1969, uh, another uh, uh, bacterium was uh, isolated from Yellowstone. Uh, and that bacteria lived at 80 degrees. And it actually could not live at temperatures below 80 degrees. So it was... Uh, it, it, it needed these high temperatures, but it happily lived there. Um, so in 74, someone uh, coined the term extremophile, which is Greek for the love of the extreme. So we compare everything to ourselves, and then we say, okay, well, you have these critters, and they actually live under these extreme conditions. But then, of course, you can wonder, are we actually that normal, or are that, is that extreme life much more normal than terrestrial life? So if you then look at extremophiles, on one hand, you have the faculty for streamophiles, so they don't have to live under extreme conditions, but they can adapt to them. And on the other hand, you have obligate extremophiles, and they have to live under these conditions. For example, those bacteria that were extracted from Yellowstone that have to live at 80 degrees, and everything below that is too cold. Uh, you may have seen this, this before. Uh, this has been this this kind of animal has been in the news. Uh, relatively frequent lately. It's called a uh, tardigrade or a water bear. Uh, and these critters are, of course, complex life. They're not uh, single cellular. Uh, and they seem to survive uh, nearly everything. And um, uh, so they've even taken uh, to uh, outer space uh, or on the outside of the International Space Station, and they even survived that. So this is a nice, nice little example of extreme life. Um, so you have different names for those different conditions, thermophiles, cyprophiles, piezophiles, halophiles. And now I'm just going to real quickly run you through a few uh, conditions so that you get a little bit of feel for what humans can do in bacteria. So if you look at humans, we actually live around this, uh, this temperature range. This is the highest temperature that's recorded on the Earth's surface. Uh, and if you look at bacteria, they can actually live between minus 18 and plus 120 degrees. Uh, of course, you have to keep in mind, we're saying we can live here. It's not that one single species of bacteria can actually live at both minus 18 and, and plus 122 degrees. So it is a bit um, unfair to say, well, those bacteria, they can spend the whole range because they're also very niche specific. But at least you have bacteria that can live at very cold and very hot temperatures. If you look at the pressure, you see that for us, ambient pressure is 101 bar. Uh, and then if you look at, uh, or 101 kilopascal, uh, if you look at what we can do is Mount Everest basically to a deep dive, but we already need some assistance. Uh, we actually do already need oxygen, but at least we're not being completely compressed. Uh, but if you look at bacteria, they can actually span the whole range. And if you look at pH, it's basically the same. So humans live around neutral pH, while bacteria, again, well, they don't go to the, uh, to, to the very uh, alkali uh, conditions, but as you can see, they, they basically span the whole range as well. And the same kind of counts for salinity. We like 0.9, halophiles need, oh, need 4% to grow, um, but you can see that also in salinity, you can see a whole range of bacteria. So basically, if you think about habitability, you have to make your decision. Are you looking for human ha habitability or are you actually focusing on bacteria? And as you can see, bacteria can actually, they're much more adaptable and the, you can expect them to live on much different places. For example, on different moons and planets. So for here on, you can of course then start speculating a little bit. Because if you go to lower temperatures, could you have another solvent than water? For example, ammonia or methane. Hey, on uh, Titan, we have liquid methane. Could that be used as a solvent for at least some of the processes? Um, 
You could imagine that a higher temperature could drive different chemistry. Uh, maybe you can, uh, some of the necessary elements of this uh, schnapps, maybe you can replace one of those elements with something else. Um, so the question is, are we looking at, uh, right now, of course, we're looking at our own life. But if you look at habitability, maybe you should look for the existence of niche environments and not look at the planet itself. So now what I hope, I have given you a little bit an idea of what to do with habitability. Uh, and I, I'm not entirely sure what challenges you've been uh, right, uh, sub subscribing to. But now you have an idea whether this is possible uh, and what you have to think about if you want to go to a scenario like this. And with this, I would like to end. Thank you very much. We'll open the room up for a couple questions. I had a question. Uh, by the way, I also studied at Delft, so it's nice to see you uh, at the same faculty. So it's really cool to see what you're presenting. Uh, um, how do we know how close we are to finding a new place? That's, of course, uh, the, the question, what do you mean with finding a new place? Like, uh, we're looking for a new place to live in. For humans, uh, if you yes. want to expand to, yeah. Well, that's, of course, what you, if you, um, the point with, with the detection of exoplanets, well, we now, we now get an, a little bit of an idea whether an exoplanet is terrestrial or not. Yeah. We also have a little bit of an idea of whether the planet is in the habitable zone, which is then, of course, important for the liquid water. We can have a bit an idea of the composition, or at least the bulk composition of the atmosphere. So from there on, you, you can, and that's what they tried with Kepler in the diagram as well. Had they plot a few uh, um, planets. Of course, then the next question is, uh, how, how do you get there? Well, that's a yeah. completely different challenge because do you actually, ca um, when can we travel to exoplanets? Uh, for now, not because it's, they're just too far away. Yeah. Um, and then if you look within our own solar system, well, of course you can imagine ex human exploration of our solar system. Uh, you can easily imagine humans living on Mars, for example, but then of course you have to get so, you, you have to just bring a lot of precautions because Currently, Mars is not habitable the way that we want it to be habitable. So yeah. then you either have to think about terraforming Mars, which um, I'm, I'm not a personal very favorite, uh, very yeah. favor, but that's because I'm interested in detecting life on Mars. And exactly. If you start terraforming it, you can't detect that anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how it, it really, and I think part of this is also a, a change in focus and in mindset. I think if, if people and agencies decide this is where we want to go and they dump a lot of money in it that's where we go that's that's that might not let's be so uh, far let's away. see if the room has uh, has more questions uh, i was wondering because you mentioned you're not a big fan of terraforming uh, because your personal preference maybe but is there also uh, any scientific reasons why we shouldn't terraform or why we should terraform maybe uh, it, it depends on for me it's it's purely personal i'm interested in in is there life outside the earth and is it similar life or is it different life and how did life originate and by ha can we learn from mars for example because it's the closest and we can get there easily um so as soon as you start terraforming mars it's going to be very difficult to figure out if there was life uh, or sustain the conditions of terrestrial life of course this is all very hypothetical um, but so that will be for me a reason to say, well, you know, I'd, I'd like to explore Mars the way it is at the moment. Um, yeah, if, if you think about humans migrating, uh, I'm not entirely sure if how easy it is to terraform, but then terraforming might of course be an option because in, instead of keeping bringing stuff from the earth and replenishing your, your, your newly built habitat that way, if you can do it in situ, it makes life much easier. So in that sense, sure, you totally should do it. So one last question. Yes, let's first find life on Mars, and then we can talk about it. We're taking one last question. Anyone? <laughs> one more. By the way, does everybody know what terraforming is? Ter terraforming means that you actually cre recreate the conditions of the Earth. So basically that you make something into another terra. But that means you need to take on a, a lot of stuff with you, right? To yeah, but what people are exploring, for example, is, you know, when you talk about microbes, uh, we know that there are different, uh, different strains of microbes that could 
with some help, survive on the on uh, the surface of Mars. So what you can imagine is that you use those kind of microbes to help create an atmosphere or to help uh, create some soil. Because you know, if you if you look at Mars or the Moon, it's all just dust, yeah. dry dust with nothing. And that's what people are studying. Can we use microbes? to uh, to change the environment because y you and those microbes are on mars or are they taken with us well, if that that's w this is stuff that people research in the lab in order to eventually bring to mars and then cultivate it there yeah. currently there's well we hope there is no terrestrial bacteria on mars that's why they yeah. they clean and sterilize all the spacecraft that go it's kind of like a noah's ark right they're taking all that's the basically okay. the idea then yeah so you also mentioned that it's preferable for a habitable planet to have a moon well, that might that I, that that I had a question mark there. It, that okay. it might be, yeah. Okay, sure, but does it make a difference if a planet would have multiple moons versus to one moon, or is that negative or positive in any way? Well, it, it's you know the the reason why they they mention moon is because it we have this obliquity that ha keeps our seasonality, mm -hmm. and we don't want to get rid of our seasonality because our our whole life is now structured around that, uh, and the moon helps to keep the Earth tilted. So if you remove the moon, your tilt is gone, or in the case of the Earth. But I mean, if you look at, for example, uh, uh, Uranus is basically tilted 90 degrees. So Uranus rotates in the plane of the, its rotation and the sun. Uh, Uranus has, I think, two tiny moons that have nothing to do with its rotational axis. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, let me think. I had one more. Um, the thing you said, uh, the Earth is optimal for us humans, but that's again from what we know. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's so. That's, but that's this, this whole discussion. It's always from our point of view. Yeah, because maybe there's another planet that's even better for us. Or well, that's yeah, but that's that's of course. Y there's the division between the whole philosophical aspect of this and the whole like fundamental science, science part yeah, of yeah, this. Yeah. We can only study what we know. Yeah. Uh, philosophically, you can go much further, uh, and and of course, that's in this context. I think it's it's actually quite important because uh, you also don't. You sometimes you need external triggers to think about something else, and yeah. you need people to take risks and do experiments uh, that that are a little bit outside the beaten track. Yeah. And, uh, For know? sure, especially when you're discovering something new. Yeah, exactly. You just don't know. And you yeah. don't know unless you try. So, yeah. uh, And th that's where you need the philosophy. I think uh, this uh, deserves a, a very big round of applause. It's been very interesting uh, uh, exploring what we don't know. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you very, very much. much. There is a gift for you. Oh. Um, and if you'd like to ask more questions, uh, uh, Inge Luce will okay. be standing uh, here uh, just at the benches. Oh, will I? And yes. people can ask you more questions if they have any. Yes. Thank you. Okay, Ellen.